Thank you. And next we have recognitions. We have Maine's 2022 State History Teacher of the Year Award, Superintendent Tager. Yes, the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History announced that Jeffrey Wingard from Bangor High School was named Maine's 2022 State History Teacher of the Year. The History Teacher of the Year Awards highlights the crucial importance of history education by honoring exceptional American history teachers. State winners receive a $1,000 prize and an archive of classroom resources. We're very proud of you, Jeff, and I'd like to bring up Principal Butler to make a couple comments. <laughs> These things don't happen by accident, and uh, I wasn't aware of the award, but when I got a chance to nominate Right, on uh, Jeff Lingard's behalf, I realized the substance and the quality of this uh, content area teacher the year award is really uh, the, uh, the weight of that institute behind it, the fact that it's a state by state and a national award, it's history, it's tradition, all of the things spoke to Jeff, he, he checks off all the boxes. and. Uh, uh, one thing I can say is uh, uh, he's been a teacher leader uh, for all of his time at Bangor High School that I've known him for 12 years now and then assumed teacher formal uh, teacher leadership as a department chair. And uh, he is 100% committed to instruction and he wears those hats so well. He, uh, if I need a place to feel good and about uh, uh, academics at Bangor High School, I go sit in Jeff's room and I have a hard time holding back because he does it just right, engages kids. Uh, you can always see the gears turning about assessment or conversation or filament of a conversation we had in the three years or, or more below uh, before that is coming alive in what he's doing. He sets direction well, he sets tone well, and uh, it's a terrific honor. And um, to have uh, somebody such a high quality person as Jeff to recognize his teacher of the year. So all the school congratulates Jeff and uh, really, really proud of him. Thank you, Jeff. You want to come out? We want to present the speech. Go Rams. Go Rams. We're <laughs> good. Thanks. Congratulations. Well, <laughs> so Congratulations once again. Okay, so next we have uh, public comments. And as a reminder, Members of the public may address the school committee for up to three minutes on school and education matters. Complaints or allegations concerning specific employees or students will not be allowed, but will be addressed through established policies and procedures. Public comments shall be directed to the school committee and be brief and not repetitive. The school committee's practice is not to respond or debate with speakers during the public comment period. The superintendent or his staff will follow up on comments outside of the staff meeting as appropriate. Before starting, please state your name and place of residence. Any public comments tonight? Nope. Seeing none, we move on to superintendent's proposals and updates. Uh, the first action item is a capital bond and future capital purchases. Superintendent Tager. Thank you, Chair Hostin. I am recommending approval to authorize debt, ser debt services for Fruit Street Heating System, including a contingency and engineering fees not to exceed $2,600,000. If approved, the project will be presented to the City Council for their consideration. And can I get a motion, please? Second. Any discussion or questions or objections? No? <coughs> None. All in favor? Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. Next, we have several informational items. The first is information on Centegix Crisis Alert System. 
Yes, uh, we have a guest who's going on Zoom. Who's I'm going to introduce in a second. I would like to, for the school committee to to know first that I appreciate all the input that I've received from you in regard to Centegix, uh, and I, as one of the school committee members asked me, is to do a, a reference check. I called Addison Davis, the superintendent from Hillsborough Schools in Florida. They're one of the top ten biggest districts in the United States in regard to Centegix. Uh, what um, Superintendent Davis told me is that they really used um, this um, tool for medical emergencies, mental health emergencies, or if you had a uh, conflict or a fight on a campus, you could use that to get everybody to come to that site to assist that student, and you could designate who that is on your school. And of course, the lockdown is something that nobody wants to experience, but he also said that his community felt very good about having that option in talking to Chief Hathaway, Bangor Police Department. He's given me um, times from a minute and a half to three minutes that they could respond. And they're also in favor of this uh, proposal. I'd like, and what, uh, what else Superintendent Asson Davis said was that they were very responsive to the needs of the school. And if we move in this direction, which I intend to do as a lighthouse district, uh, I believe they will take care of our needs and satisfy everything that you would expect as a school committee member. So at this point, I introduce Jeff Downs. He'll provide information to the committee on Centegix, a crisis alert system. So Jeff, if you'll just give a quick summary so the public can be aware of this as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Superintendent Tager, honorable board members. I appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you today. Just wanna to make sure that you guys can see my screen with the thumbs up. Everybody's got the screen up. Can everybody hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay, good to go. All right, very good. All right, so as Superintendent Tager said, uh, speaking to our superintendent down in Hillsborough County, which is one of our actual uh, first customers for this particular product, it is all about responding to any given emergency that happens on a school campus. And so with that being said, it is a wearable technology. It is 100% focused on emergency notification. And it is as simple as press button help comes. I'm wearing a badge right now on a lanyard right around my neck. It is no thicker than two credit cards thick and no bigger than a standard issued driver's license. So it's not a very cumbersome badge to wear around. Over 2 million people are being protected of the, underneath this uh, platform today. And we've got about 250 school districts that are also on board with this all throughout the Southeast. And we are moving north to, uh, to obviously to Bangor. Um, at, uh, as we move this uh, platform forward. When we start looking at the, st the statistics of what you, uh, schools are dealing with every day, these statistics continue to rise. 18 million students are injured annually. 68% of nurses actually talk about life-threatening uh, uh, incidents that they have to respond to. And we all know from the violence of, uh, in the schoolhouses today, those, those numbers are continuing to go up. So we need to have something that we can communicate to all first responders to get there faster. We know that rapid response saves lives. It's the number one thing. The big myth is, is that rapid response technology can maybe only reside on a cell phone. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things that are inherently wrong with that. The first thing is, is low adoption rates. What we have found for most district clients is that most people don't carry their cell phones around with them. We also know that district staff does not like to actually put a, uh, an app or a um, any kind of district owned program on their personal cell phones, which, are, which basically results in low adoption rates. We also know that since it rides on a cellular backbone and a lot of buildings cannot get full 100% coverage of service inside of those buildings, it creates dead zones. And then therefore, if there is an emergency that happens in part of the building where the service does not actually activate, we can't get that signal out. So that's a huge problem when you think about responding to any given crisis. The other part is inaccurate location information. This, at our GPS uh, triangulation is what the usual, um, is the usual uh, thing for most of the uh, apps that are out there. And therefore they only pin something in a map, but they don't tell you what floor or what room or what location on the campus that the emergency is in. And then the other part is way too complicated in an emergency. You have to get out your phone, unlock your phone, open the app, initiate the alert. That's a lot of movements to do in a, in a chaotic situation. 
So therefore, Syntegics came up with something that was going to absolutely revolutionize security on campuses with this wearable emergency notification. It rides completely independent upon cellular network or any of the school's Wi-Fi services today. How it works basically is it's one button activation. It empowers everyone. There's a small button on the top of this badge and it's as simple as press button help comes. Total campus coverage. It's not just inside of the building. It's also on the outsides of the building. That, in, that includes your stadiums, your athletic fields, your uh, playgrounds, your parking lots, your bus ramps. This will actually cover the entire campus. And then the location information is so much more, uh, so much more advanced than just GPS triangulation. We can actually identify one of these badges in their location down to the room level, down to the foot level uh, when it comes to being outside of the building. And then the other thing is, is we litter the campuses with audio and visual notifications to let everyone know that there is an issue that's happening on campus and action needs to be taken. How it basically works on Superintendent Tager, I heard you say a minute ago, and that's so fantastic to hear about the response time in Bangor. We know on average, it's anywhere from three to eight minutes. Um, typically school violence, especially extreme situations like active shooters, they are very front loaded with casualties and fatalities. Therefore, we know we need to have something in the meantime between the time that law enforcement um, responds and how we can get people to safety. And that's where crisis alert comes in. So there are two different things that the badges can do. Each staff member will wear one. It takes three clicks, one, two, three, and a staff alert then is initiated. Those staff alerts basically are for medical emergencies, school violence, elopement, things that outside authorities do not need to be notified for, but inside security teams on the campus do need to be notified. How that basically works is once I actually initiate this alert, a campus map will be brought up and this is the sound that you will hear. Immediately, every first responder on site will get this notification that someone needs help in that room. And it's going to be blinking on their cellular app phone that they've got basically with them. And then also in the front office, as you can see on the security console here. That's how a staff alert works. When I press the button three times, the badge vibrates in my hand. So as a user, I know I've sent the message to the first responders on site. In the case of an extreme situation, like an active shooter situation, you're gonna have this happen with the intercom and the school uh, and all the terminals in the building, all of the computers will be taken over with this screen. And this is the announcement that you'll hear. Lockdown, lockdown, lock the doors, stay away from the windows. Encerrarse, encerrarse, cierren las puertas con llave. Manténganse lejos de las ventanas. As you can hear, this actually does do this in multiple language, and it will loop telling everyone that there is a lockdown scenario happening and lockdown protocol has been initiated. As this, you see on the message on the screen, every computer screen, every smart board that the district designates, they want taken over. The system will automatically take over on any given campus with this extreme alert. How the alert works is on a badge, instead of three clicks on this badge, I will just keep clicking this badge until these lights that we install in all the hallways, bathrooms, classrooms, offices, all around the campus, we will litter your campus with, with these lights. When these lights start going off red, that's what we tell people. It technically takes about eight to nine clicks on the badge to make them go off. And once they go off, all this happens simultaneously. The lights, the intercom, the screen capture, it will send a message to your first responders on site, and it will also be directly connected to your 911 dispatch in Bangor, okay? The first responders on site and also the first responders for law enforcement will be given the Syntegics companion app that goes onto their mobile devices. You can actually initiate more protocols than just lockdown. The badge can only initiate a lockdown protocol and, and call for a staff alert, but as administrator, an administrator can actually push a shelter in place, a hold in place, an evacuation, a lockout. That's how you actually uh, initiate those other types of protocols. These strobes have multicolored LED lights in them. So a lockout would be red, a shelter in place would be blue. And the same thing, the screen capture, the screen capture will look a little different than what it did with the lockdown that you just saw a minute ago. 
With our technology, we have a monitored system. So every piece of hardware that we install in any of the Bangor schools, we will have a network operations technician that is looking at the strength of that network every single day. So all those green dots you see on this page, this would be a dashboard look at what our network ops center looks at. We see the signaling strength and the energy levels of this network and we can tell the health of it and we proactively monitor it 24 seven, 365. It's the only system out there that's actually being monitored like that every single day. It also has the ability to collect a lot of data. So every alert that comes in, you'll be able to track and you'll be able to sharpen up your benchmarks as a district to respond to emergencies that much more effectively and that much faster. And it can actually pull down in several different ways. It can pull down an Excel spreadsheet. You can look at it as an alert history in a chart or as in a dashboard graph. And that's the presentation. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Um, member Luciano. Is there an opportunity to customize the additional languages that are available? Absolutely, that's a great question. Yes, you can customize all languages. You can do it in multiple, you can do multiple languages uh, as, as up to a, probably a dozen different languages all at one time. Okay, thank you. And member Surratt. I, yep, thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to be clear on something. So, so everybody in the building, all staff, faculty, et cetera, will have the lanyard with the clicker. The emergency team members will also have a cell phone. Is that correct? And so they'll need to carry that cell phone at all times. Is that correct? So the emergency responders will get the companion app and that's what actually pulls up the campus map. So if I'm a teacher, I wear one of these badges. And so when I push this badge, it would show up on this. So as a first responder, yes, you would be required to have a mobile device on you at all times. And would the issue around dead zones and would that apply to those to those cell phones? No, no, it will not because it's going to be a direct connect to the to the to the app and what it will basically do is it'll come over basically it'll take over the network and run through the Wi Fi if it needs to to connect to a map if there is any dead zones. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments and just for clarification, we have met as a school committee. Um, during uh, executive session to talk about confidential logistics and so most of us I think all of us have had a chance to ask questions uh, of both Ray and, and Superintendent Tager um, and so thank you so much and as I'm hitting the campaign trails uh, this season and you know I'm canvassing and knocking on doors this um, is actually one of the top issues that is heavy on parents' minds. This is something school safety is a question that I get asked a lot. And so I'm happy now that we've spoken about it publicly that I can share this information. It makes many parents feel safe. So thank you both so much. Thank you, thank you Jeff. Thank you thank very you, much. Have a nice evening. You too. Okay. So next we have a curriculum update. Assistant Superintendent Kathy Harris-Smedberg will provide you a curriculum update. So first I would like to thank all the faculty and administrators who work collaboratively with me to make these updates. Their import research, probing questions and hard work really made this work successful. Um, in addition, uh, when at, tasked with um, looking at adding more diversity, social emotional learning, things like that within it. I have to say the staff was relentless in this. And so I brought things that you can look at at some time and you can see all the lovely books. Um, and thanks to Mrs. Silk, Ms. Will Silk, who actually got them all together for me. And these go up to grade five also, but not here. I just have grades uh, pre-K through three. Um, and then I have some pacing guides that you might wanna look at also. Um, the Bangor School Department continues to follow the main law and adherence to the main learning results um, for the K-8 curriculum, so all curriculum work is enhancing the instruction of the MLRs. So the projects that we did, pre-K, <clears throat> uh, we do follow the main early learning and development standards as our curriculum basis. As we've moved to a full day of pre-K, we needed to round the curriculum out. Uh, we address the language arts through the Fontes and Pinnell materials that we have here um, so that when moving to kindergarten, I think we're going to find a stronger foundation due to the consistency of learning and the set of spiraling skills that they're all building off from. 
In math at pre-K, we incorporate a series of hands-on learning experiences, which allow students to use manipulatives to better understand concepts. So basically, teachers got totes full of materials that students can use for counting, patterning, um, just anything that makes them better mathematicians. Um, as part of the full day, we had to look at the full schedule. So we've added active experiential learning time, a rest time themes. They're all built into pre-K. Pre-K is pretty amazing here. <laughs> um, we've just been very pleased with the richness of which the quality of program has occurred. And finally, assessments were updated. Um, K through five ELA curriculum, again, was updated. And again, we're using these books here. <laughs> Uh, the materials are designed to support the workshop model, which means whole group instruction, small group instruction, individual help. Um, and so it all supports that type of learning, which we've had as instructional practice for years beyond me. Um, components include, but are not exclusive to, interactive read-alouds, reading mini lessons, writing mini lessons, sharing reading, phonics, spelling, and word study, guided reading, book clubs, independent reading collections. It's a very well-rounded study. Pacing guides were developed to ensure consistency and efficacy of the learning for all the students. Again, we provided professional development before school got out in the spring, as well as during Teacher Academy this fall. Uh, I think you'll find the teachers are really thrilled with them, especially the threats that I got if I don't return these books. <laughs> Um, K to 12 uh, school counselors were trained in the Why Try program. This is a supplemental program designed to provide students with simple hands on strategies and resources to motivate unmotivated students, support students with trauma, improve student engagement, increase academic success, and teach social and emotional education through visual analogies. And it's reinforced through the use of music, hands on activities, and multimedia. Um, again, we're still using the second step as our primary focus, but why try is an enhancement to that. I did want to share a story that Kristen Tillily shared with me. She's the counselor at Fairmount. She says, the students love the visual metaphor of the roller coaster. I had a student come up to me and say, I have been on the fast and easy track my whole life. He's nine. <laughs> and I really want to get in on the harder but worth it track. <laughs> So something stuck with the student in a very positive way. Uh, grades six through eight also had ELA updates. And again, we follow the main learning results. Um, but what is unique about ELA compared to other subjects is that you're increasing levels of sophistication. So for example, punctuation is covered multiple years. So elementary grades might see the use of how to use periods, uh, explanation points or something like that. Whereas you go up, you'll see point of ellipses and so semicolons, things like that. Um, so we reviewed um, some of the changes that happened in the main learning results um, and incorporated a persistent progression of sophistication um, and addressed the needs of how to level up at each grade level. Common topics were, success, were selected for each quarter that promoted or enhanced the skills that we we're focusing on and ensured that our middle school students were being exposed to well-rounded and robust educational experiences. Essential questions were developed, and I want you to understand that um, when you say we're going to do theme, theme is kind of broad. So what is it that we want to make sure a sixth grader understands about theme or a seventh grader? They, they differ. Uh, common assessments were developed and refined, and writing expectations were built into each project. Again, with the 6 through 8 ELA, we really focused upon incorporating a larger range of diversity and understanding of different cultures um, as part of per, uh, promoting the skills that they're trying to work on. Grades six through eight, science. Uh, again, we do the main learning results as well as the next generation science standards. Uh, we started by reviewing the MLRs, which also underwent some changes at the state level. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we had a good progression between six through eight and didn't have redundancies or gaps. So that was all firmed up. Um, we have a vertical alignment of labs and content was then conducted for similar reasoning and alignment between East and West. Um, so we made that recalibration happen. We updated pacing guides, again, um, incorporated more hands activities, understanding that labs are how students learn really well, refined the assessments and then brought diversity into our lessons. Essential questions were also developed. Um, again, so something like space is pretty vast, figuratively and literally, <laughs> um, and making sure that we had core components that we wanna make sure all our students understand. 
Um, we uh, made a database of resources and extra labs that teachers can access. And we updated the standards-based report card to better reflect those overarching understandings that all students need to know in their scientific study. Grades six through eight social studies followed a similar process that uh, science did. Again, we reviewed the MLRs because they were changed. Uh, they went some major changes. They added the school finance units as well as Wapnaki studies. Um, so there was a bit more work that we needed to do in this area. Um, we did the vertical alignment, again, making sure that we had um, the levels that we needed for each grade level. Common assessments and rubrics were developed. Essential questions were also developed. Um, we did a lot of work with Wapnaki studies, and I did bring one of the pieces. And what we have done is we've interwoven it throughout the entire year, so it doesn't feel like a standalone. Uh, it's something that should just be just a part of the generalized understanding of how social studies works. Um, uh, the financial literacy is also built in. That is more of a standalone um, time, although they have some pieces and activities that are littered throughout the year. And it's basically to help our children understand uh, financial literacy. Um, grades 9 through 12 also did some curriculum work. The department heads led these. And again, we did 9 through 12 English. Um, the foci for them were common reading assessments, revising scope and sequences for moving to the block schedule to the mod schedule. Uh, social studies did the same thing. Again, they had to incorporate the Wabnaki studies in the personal finance. So those were areas that were addressed and were languages I worked on their vertical alignment uh, to ensure that consistency was had from grade six through 12. And again, at the high school level plan for the change from block scheduling to mod scheduling. And that about covers it. Do you have any questions? <laughs> we're busy this summer and there's more to do. There's always more to do. But <laughs> any questions? Um, Member Sorg. Excuse me. Yes. Do we have any data yet on the transition of our students from last year who were pre-K to K where they fit as far as being academically prepared for kindergarten? Um, they're actually not doing too badly. We do, I, would, I would want to get the actual data for you. Mm -hmm. The students that attended the full day kindergarten knocked it out of the park. I mean, it was just staggeringly amazing. Um, and, you know, there are areas in each that had strengths and weaknesses. Rhyming still seems to be something that we struggle with a little bit, but we've, we've when, when we did our pre-K curriculum work, we incorporated more opportunities for rhyming, brought back a lot of things like nursery rhymes and um, things that would help kid, children with cadence and rhyming and understanding like that sounds. So um, I'm very excited that we have more schools, two more schools that have full day pre-K. Um, and we're, I think we'll see equally good results. So I'm hopeful. Other questions, comments? No? All right. Thank you so much. Okay. And next is reading recovery update. Yeah, that's me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to get some help though. Somebody's going to come and set up a slide show for me. Thank you. Of course. So for some of you, this will seem, um, you, you, it's kind of the same thing. Reading recovery doesn't really change except for the data. Um, but uh, it may be a good learning for people that are new. So. Um, so we know that reading is really, really important. We know that levels of um, incarceration are increased if they're below grade level. We know that they have more behavioral and social emotional problems in subsequent grades. They have less opportunity to graduate. Uh, it's just. There's so many things that happen or that can happen or more apt to happen, I should say, if students are not reading at their grade level. Um, we do know that 10 to 15% of students in Maine will drop out if they are not reading at grade level. This is right in Maine. Um, and between 64 and 83% of those incarcerated read at less than a fourth grade level. Um, literacy rates are also lower among those living in poverty. Um, having um, more unemployment rates, uh, less likely to attend higher education. And um, I've kind of shared those similar things, so I think we're going for that. 
Uh, we do know that if they have intervention that's early and well structured that they can have high levels of success. We find reading recovery is one of our most successful interventions. Um, so reading recovery is a short term reading intervention for 20 weeks for only first graders. It provides intensive individual instruction. Um, and it is identified through common assessments and the services are provided by our highly trained teachers, specifically our literacy coaches and our Title I teachers. The primary goal is basically to get them reading at grade level, <laughs> um, but they also hope, you know, it's going to enhance all the other aspects of their lives, self-esteem, um, just feeling good about themselves as a student and a person. Um, so I said this one-on-one -on -one instruction, highly trained teachers, and actually I should uh, clarify the highly trained they have to take reading recovery courses and they have to maintain it so every year they're involved in making sure they're staying current and up to date on the reading recovery practices um, the inclusion includes phonemic awareness phonics guided oral reading comprehension and fluency we have them at four of our five um, pre-k to three schools fruit street does not have it because they are not a title one school and reading recovery is funded by title one in our district Ms. Principal Fournier would love to have that change. Just <laughs> there are 11 reading recovery teachers. There are five literacy coaches. Oh, well, that doesn't add up. Five literacy coaches and five Title I teachers. That should be 10. Sorry about that. <sighs> yes, I can do math. <laughs> oh, golly. <laughs> um, we are part of what's called the Eastern Maine Reading Recovery uh, Group, and this uh, includes schools that are from the Bangor and Ellsworth areas. There are 28 schools and 131 students that were serviced this year. There are different outcomes. We want them to discontinue. That doesn't sound like it's a great thing, but it is. Discontinue means that they've met all the benchmarks, they've achieved what we want them to achieve. Recommended means that they did not meet the benchmarks. They met, they need further help, but they did really well. <laughs> Incomplete, the program um, was not completed, moved, student moved during a program, and then other, the parent might have stopped the services or something happened to interrupt the learning. So in Bangor, we had 12 students. Um, we ha we're having fewer and fewer students because um, we are finding we have stronger needs. And so to say that some students can't get any services at all, we'd rather have them in a small literacy group um, than to not get any type of help. So I've said that they only get two rotations. They, each teacher and coach will get their first 20 weeks and a second 20 weeks, not the literacy coaches because there are other things going. But um, So of those 12 students, 58% um, were discontinued. And that reflects similarly to the Eastern Maine cohort, which was 60%. You can see 25% of the students uh, made progress but did not meet benchmark, whereas they had 21%. They're, they're relatively close. Um, here's the breakdown by schools. Now you should be a little cautious about understanding these percentages because when you have one student and they don't make it 0%, I mean, it's a little deceiving and 50%. So it, the, the end sample size is, is not really what we would like to have. But if you can see our district had 58%, well, Eastern Maine had a total of 48%. And they no longer uh, give us information about state and national data anymore. And this is Bangor, Eastern Maine, and national data. Again, they haven't done it. And there are asterisks from 19, 2019 to 2022. And again, we had a high rate of people not continuing because, well, in 2020, we shut school down. So people that were in that second 20 week never finished. So those are all incomplete. 2020, 21, we had a lot of um, people that were in and out. Um, so again, there was a higher level of incomplete. And 21, 22, we're starting to get back, but absences still continue. But so still, still all right. <laughs> um, students who were discontinued made an average growth of a year and a half. I mean, so these are substantial gains. And those that were recommended also made a growth of a year and a half. So even though they didn't make benchmark, they still grew over a year and a half. Um, and then students who are incomplete, didn't finish the program, made 1.2 years of growth. An average first grader makes one year of growth. These are my resources. And do you have any questions? Any questions, Member Sorg? Yes, I got questions tonight. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Is the phonics method the only method they use? Or no. What else do they use? They use phonemic awareness. Um, I can't remember the four points, but it's, it's a comprehension, vocabulary. It's a wide range of, of... Do they use good old-fashioned sight word if a child yes. can't give phonics? Yeah, their sight words are part of it. Okay. It's a component. It's not the whole thing. Okay. The other question was, and I think I've asked you this before, but I wanted it to be brought out. If a child does not make it in Title I, is there assistance for them, say like in second grade, third grade? So they, we offer Title I support in grades K through five. So that Title support is still available in our Title schools. Not all schools have Title. Okay. Um, and Title is based upon an allocation by the federal government based upon the number of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. So I'm always saying, even though everybody get free lunch, these forms are still really important because the federal government depends on these forms in which to tell us how much allocation we get for Title I. So do both of our fourth and fifth grades? No, Mary Snow does not receive Title I this year for the first time, Fairmount does. And we should know that reading struggles know no socioeconomic bounds, but the money is tied to the free and reduced lunch levels. I mean, a child does not have to qualify for free or reduced to get services, but the allocation to the school is dependent upon the percentage. So they have to have 40% or more of their students um, receive free or reduced lunch in order to qualify as a Title I school. Once you've qualified, you can dip below to that 35%, but if you're below that, then you can't. Mary Snow, 14th, lost their funding this year because they have dropped below the 35% for multiple years, actually. There is still help there for those students who don't read at grade level. They don't have title help, no. That's right, but there is still help there. Well, not specific title help, no. Okay. <laughs> Tricky question, huh? Well, um, so through the COVID grant, they do have a tutor that would provide interventions for them. But once that grant goes away, then it's going to really depend upon solid work of classroom instructors. Hmm. So I have a question. Um, do we have um, anything or a program or something to really engage parents or guardians? Um, and I'm thinking about you know, the, the community aspect part of it and how social determinants of health affect and significantly impact literacy. And so I'm wondering how, um, do, you know, for low socioeconomic status and even, you know, students um, who have parents, guardians from diverse cultures and backgrounds who probably don't read to their children. So do we have anything in place to really engage with parents, guardians to Oh, yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> So we have our, their peak events, and the peak events are specifically geared to help parents help their children at home. Um, and so the activities are usually grade age appropriate, um, and they often go home with something to help reinforce the skill at home. Um, part of part of reading recovery is um, parent like they send home book bags so that they're supposed to be reading at home with instructions on how to do it. Um, and anytime the title works, they're more than happy to reach out to parents if they have individual questions about that. The peak events though are really fun uh, because they're they're there's usually a really neat activity to help reinforce one of the thing, I mean, a couple of things like they have measuring cups and they do a cooking activity um, another group built bookcases so that they'd want to have books to have their own library at home they show them how to read they'll give them um, like a bookmark that will tell them how to read with their child i mean you think reading with your child is a very simple thing but it's not um, you know, some people just take over and the kids don't see the words or how the page is turned or talk about pictures or things like that. So there's small things that we try to put out, not so overwhelming that it becomes difficult, but in small bites so that they can really, you know, absorb it and make it part of their routines. Excellent. And are home visits included in this? Uh, we don't do home visits okay. typically, no, especially since COVID. With COVID, I know. Hopefully we're <laughs> at the tail end of it. Yes, right. perfect. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I asked Mr. Fournier this question before, but but for um, Fruit Street students uh, who do need this, are they just kind of shuffled or what, what happens to, to your students? I think you answered this question before, but I don't recall the answer. You mean this? Good evening. You mean the students yes. because we don't have title support? Yes. Uh, creative. Um, Currently, we hired an academic support at Tech. Um, 
and based off data, first grade will get support, and then along with second and now third. And then after six weeks, we, we will review the data and make the changes if necessary. So great teachers, creative, and always work in the process. So Excellent school. I just, I, I worry so much about students. No, we, we, we always make sure we try to get all the students who need the help, the help they deserve, either through community school as yes. well. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, do you have an after school reading support program? Uh, we have community school, so depending on what we're offering, sometimes we offer writing, math, reading, so. Okay. And then we also mix it in with Mrs. Libby, mm -hmm. the art teacher who does literacy and art. <clears throat> and so she usually ties something in together. So try to get them all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions, questions Sarah? Member Luciano? No, you're good. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Okay, next we have report of reassignments for school year 2022-2023. I'm reporting the following teacher reassignments for school year 2022-2023. Jillian Cookson from Speech and Language Pathologist at Point 8 Fairmont School and Point 2 14th Street School to Speech and Language Pathologist at Point 5 Fairmont School and Point 5 14th School. Thank you. We move on to business action items. Uh, we have action items. First, we have minutes, regular meeting of September 14th, 2022. I'm recommending approval of the draft minutes of the September 14th, 2022 regular school committee meeting. Motion, please. Second. Uh, any questions or discussion? All in favor? Any Passes seven questions? zero, thank you. Next, we have a financial report. Uh, first, we have an unaudited June financial report. I'm recommending approval of the unaudited June financial report and the July financial report. So we're, we're taking the two you together? Can, you can, yeah. Okay, yep. we'll take them together. Uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Passes 7 0. Thank you. Uh, next, we have bids and quotations. I'm recommending approval of the September bids and quotations report. Motion, please. So moved. Second. And we have a question from Member Sprague. Thank you. I, I'm not going to oppose this. I don't have any reason to, and I'm not going to micromanage the bid process other than to just to say that it's a really weak bid season right now, I think. And when you look through the report, there's a lot of items that are only getting one or two bids. And I think if work doesn't need to get done immediately, there's nothing wrong with pulling it back and rebidding it next year when I think the bid environment is going to be more advantageous. We could save 10 or 20% or more on some of these in a more competitive bid environment. And I get that some of the work just has to be done, but otherwise I think we should try to pull some back and maybe save, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially if we save a little bit here and there. So again, not going to micromanage it. I think you're probably fully aware of what I'm saying already, but I just wanted to draw attention to that. Thanks. Did you want to comment, Jerry, or no? no. Sure. So thank you for the comment. Um, I, I do feel your pain every time we send a um, project out for um, bid solicitations and sometimes we get none, sometimes we get one. When we get more than one, we're extremely happy. The, and, and I agree with you fully, except for the, um, if they're COVID funded, we're on extreme timeline or a deadline, if you will, for those projects one of our COVID grants just ended in September. Well, it ends tomorrow. And then another one ends next September 30th. And the one after that, the following. So we're limited in when we can do some of these major projects. Um, we cannot do them with the um, children in the buildings. So we're really limited to our summer seasons, which really um, makes it difficult to do major projects and get them done when the bell rings in June and have the building back ready 
at the end of August. So we're really, for the one that will expire next year, I need to get them lined up now. I need people on the contract for next June and next summer. And I'll do the same for the following summer. So, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And any other questions? Nope. All in favor. Thank you. Seven zero. Next, we have personnel. We have extra duty assignments. I'm recommending committee approval of the following extra duty assignments for the school year 2022-2023. Joshua Johnson, Chorus Director, James F. Dowdy School. Kate Liftoloff, Freshman Class Advisor, Bangor High School. Justin Jock, Freshman Class Advisor, Bangor High School. Stephanie Hendricks, Speech Advisor, Bangor High School. Heather Hopkins, Point Five, Graduation Senior Events Coordinator, Bangor High School. Eric Hutchins, Point Five, Graduation Senior Events Coordinator, Bangor High School. Motion, please. Any questions or discussion? No? All in favor? That's a seven zero. Thank you. Next, we have a second policy, a second reading of a policy, uh, revised policy GDB9, Supplemental Compensation Guide. I'm recommending second reading of a revised policy, revised policy GDB9, Supplemental Compensation Guide. Motion, please. Second. Any questions or discussion? No, nope. all in favor? Passes 7-0, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have donations and member Sprague, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. To Abraham Lincoln School from the Charleston Church, backpacks and school supplies having a total dollar value of $300. To Abraham Lincoln School from Donald Sawyer, a cash donation for the Abraham Lincoln School Garden having a total dollar value of $4,000. To Fruit Street School from the Charleston Church, backpacks and school supplies having a total dollar value of $200. To Fruit Street School from TD Bank, school supplies having a total do total dollar value of three hundred dollars. With gratitude, I would make a motion to accept. Can I get a second? second. All in favor? I have a question. Oh, sorry, Member uh, Sictors. Um, I, I was wondering if somebody could talk a little bit about the um, Abraham Lincoln School Garden. <coughs> Is that Director Babin? <laughs> well. We Th may have to save that for the next okay. one. She is not here today, well, the principal. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, I don't think we voted. Motion, uh, vote, please. That's a 7-0, thank you. Thank you so much. And we don't have any introduction items. So moving on to committee updates. Um, but first, any comments or questions from the committee? First chance. <laughs> okay, let's move on to um, representatives reports. Do we have any from UTC? No, anything? No, nothing yet. And and we will have um, more assignments at our reorganizational meeting. So um, more to come on that. And um, do we have a student committee member update? Member Sada. Thank you. So I'd like to bring up an issue that's been happening at the high school, and I'm sure some of you are already aware of it, but last week when we had those crazy rainstorms, the high school building didn't do too well handling the sudden intake of water. Um, there were major leaks in the roof due to the roof construction. Uh, ceiling tiles were falling in the hallways. They had to close down the ramps. I knew of like one or two classes that had to be relocated because their classrooms were unusable. Uh, so as you can imagine, I've heard from a number of students and staff that this was very disruptive to the learning environment during those couple of days. And we do appreciate what the administration did to try to mitigate the effects of this. You know, for example, there was more leniency on tardiness to class because students had to like walk all the way around the building because they were, you know, rerouted. And, but like, I'm just bringing this up so that people are aware, you know, we need to ask how did we let this happen? How can we prevent it with future construction projects? 
especially during construction projects that happen during the school year. In other news, uh, a lot of schools are preparing for fall events already. Um, the homecoming dance and the homecoming game will happen um, in no time and students are preparing for spirit week where students can dress up for different theme days and uh, I think it's planned to have a full week of advisory so that there can be more fun activities during that week in early October. Um, and in addition, high school seniors will have an opportunity for on the spots admissions at the high school in October, a lot of main public universities and Community colleges will be coming to interview students who are interested and they'll make decisions on the spot about admission and financial aid and all of that so that is a really good opportunity for many students so that's all I have, thank you. Thank you so much. Superintendent Tager, do you want to address? Do you want to just make a mention about the roof? Yeah. <laughs> Very brief. I, yeah. did, I did receive many questions. Yeah, I've said it all. Some of it behind closed doors frustration, and you've said it eloquently. We've been frustrated, but we see that there's um, a need, opportunity. Uh, we gridded it out. I think there, uh, it's fair to say there could have been uh, better communication up and down the line, but really the way I look at it, it's the nature of a huge project and seizing a big opportunity. Uh, those days were terrible. Uh, it was confounding because uh, the, the roof that had stood up in ways and stood up against rain uh, in ways previous to those two days that Caroline mentioned didn't stand up oddly on days that were, were truthfully less of issues than before. Um, I was encouraged to take comfort in the uh, finishing of the structural steel, which I did, and that meant that all the 142 holes that went in the roof were we're, we're patched. Uh, they're getting the decking on now. Uh, we're the customer. They've treated us like the customer, and we've licked our wounds internally. It's been good leadership, from Mr. Tager, and our engineers to do it better. That's been my question too, Caroline. But uh, there's there's not been any bad faith. There's been good opportunity to seize things that came along. And uh, like I've said, if any school can do it, ours can. And uh, I promise you that I won't. Uh, 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 Look forward to the day that I have to do that and anything that I can do to make sure that uh, we're more uh, aware and able to uh, dodge and weave. We certainly will. But kids have been great and glad that the finish line is coming. Yes, thank, <laughs> thank you. And I, and I do want to address this too. And I want the school committee to know that we're obviously grateful for the federal funds that we have received. And we have a number of projects into uh, Member Sprague's comment, uh, I want to, to, to just kind of bring it to, to your attention that the Fruit Street heating system actually came in lower than we thought it was originally. So we are looking at those things. And this project at the high school was supposed to, and Jerry, you could not, if I'm right or wrong, last over a year, I believe, and they're going to be two years. And it'll be done in one year in November. And, there, and Caroline, you're right, there were some hardships along the way. And where um, Principal Butler and I were both frustrated is when there were leaks and there were two days that were particularly bad, it was our custodial staff that really rose and did all the work. I mean, they had a machine that they were getting all the water up there, filling 55 gallon buckets full of water and doing all the work. And uh, Principal Butler and I were able to meet with the contractor with Mr. Heyman as well, Director Heyman. And it just seemed like our custodians showed that they really cared and we weren't getting the support from the contractor. I could tell you that after the meeting when we had the second day of rain, the contractor freed up people from the job to kind of patrol those two, it was uh, a, a, B and D, I think, right? So A and B didn't leak at all after the meeting. And then D, um, they went and they problem solved how to solve those problems. But with a project this size, there were gonna be leaks, it was not, um, all that surprising, but we had hoped people would probably chip in better to solve those problems as they occurred. And the other part that people probably don't realize, it's a big job and the, the, the idea behind it was so the roof can hold snow. And we now have probably the strongest roof in the state of Maine, I would guess. But the other option was to take the roof completely off, which would have meant moving students all over the building for that period of time. So. 
inconvenient, right? I'm glad you brought it up, but um, I think we're at a point now where this will be done mid-November and it'll be a hopefully a, a memory that we can all forget at some point. It was any of that accurate or inaccurate, Jerry? Did I do okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs> and I just want to add too that I received a lot of the emails from either staff or students or parents, and so um, we did our due diligence. And I would relay them to Superintendent Tager, and and I applaud his leadership and Principal Butler because they addressed every single you know thing that was um, that was brought to our attention. And so and they would circle back. And and if you could, as our representative, to sh you know share that out with the students as well, allowing them to know that we really you know, took their concerns and their frustration at heart and try to do due diligence. But as um, as everyone said here, we had to really capitalize on this COVID money that we had. So crossing our fingers for no more. <laughs> yeah. um, and with that, we move to informational items. We have several important dates. We have Thursday, October 13th, 2022, regular meeting, 7 p.m. Council Chambers. Wednesday, October 26, 2022, regular meeting here, 7 p.m. Council Chambers. Monday, November 14th, we have our reorganizational meeting, uh, 11 a.m. here in Council Chambers. Um, and then Wednesday, November 16th, 2022, we have our regular meeting, 7 p.m. Council Chambers with the two new elected uh, members. Um, and then second, Second, ask for questions or comments from the committee. So I saw Member Luciana first and Member Sixers. Karen, you go ahead and go first. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I just I just wanted to kind of echo a little bit of what um, Caroline was saying. It's it's really really lovely for this class, who their freshman year everything went into lockdown, and for them to, to be able to experience and do senior activities and have some of those traditional Bangor High School festivities. And it just, I, I think the whole class is so grateful and appreciative of all the work that our administration and teachers and everybody has done to bring that back to them. So as a parent of a senior, I personally want to thank you very, very much. And I know the kids are really excited. And as on a very weird side note, um, it, it's funny because because we've been in school for the two semesters at the high school. Um, I can personally say that my daughter finds high school wicked easy right now because it's spread out over an entire school year, and she's like, "It's so much slower." I'm like, "Ah, just just wait a few few months." So so thank you, Member Luciano. Um, I was actually wondering if I could request. <laughs> So we'll see if I'm allowed to ask for this. But I was wondering if we could maybe ask for a presentation on what's available for our seniors after high school in terms of not just college education, but like preparatory for not every kid is a college kid um, and not every kid is a college kid right away. So I was just curious, I know gap years are becoming more common, but beyond that or any other training or um, preparatory materials that are being done just to sort of um, look at a wider scope of kids as they enter the adulthood, the adulthood. I, I can take that one. I, and, I, and I don't want to um, change your request at all, but I guess what I want to ask you is would it be um, worthwhile to maybe have a counselor or two come and talk about the whole gamut? Like we could talk about the on the spot admission opportunity, because that's yeah, something that that's was... available. We could talk about the fact that our senior class can go to community college for free. Mm -hmm. We could talk about, um, as you suggested, gap, gap years or other things that students might do. And, and maybe it's worthwhile to have Amanda come by from UTC to talk about certifications that students could get there. Yeah. So kind of like the whole post exactly. high school conversation. Yes, that would be great. If the school committee would like that, we can arrange it for a meeting or two out. I can help do that. Okay. Thank you. That would be something good for us to push out to Ray you know, on social we media. We could do that. Sure. All right. We'll work on setting that up for you. I won't promise it'll be our next meeting, but one of the meetings in October, I think we could have that together. Sure. Member Sifters. And I also just shared as a senior parent, all of the senior parents um, through guidance received a, here's the senior spotlight. Here are all of the different opportunities, vehicles, avenues that your seniors 
can go to where are the resources and I have just shared that information. So they've done a really phenomenal, phenomenal job this year in communicating with the with the senior parents. Thank you. Uh, Member Mendel. Yeah, I just like to echo that um, as another parent of a senior. It's been really nice to get those newsletters and to see everything that's going on in the counseling department. I, I it's been a, a big boost um, in communication there and I really appreciate it. So. Thank you. Other comments, other questions, feedback, input? Okay, and I did want to thank also, because I forgot to thank all of our custodial staff, because several of the teachers said that they did a phenomenal job at the high school and at Vine Street School and et cetera. So thank you so, so much. We couldn't get past this difficult you know, times without you all. So much gratitude. All righty, adjournment. Can I get a motion, please? Move. Second. All in favor. Pass the 7-0. Thank you. Thank you all.